Joe, let me see. Let me give um, uh, an example of this. So W.L. Gore, everything that W.L. Gore makes is made from the, the, the molecule PTFE. Everything. Everything they make is expanded polytetrafluoride. Um, they have an existing solution that they use for lots of different stuff. They search the world for markets that they don't address that they could apply that technology to. One example of that is Glide Dental Floss. You all know Glide? Okay, so what W.O. Gore did was say, what else can we use Teflon for? And they found that it made pretty good dental floss. They took an existing solution and they applied it to an adjacent market that they didn't serve. They weren't in the dental floss business. That's an example of moving that way. That's a little bit unusual. Much more typical is moving this way. All right. So an example is, you know, Utah State is has a whole set of programs that it serves. It might go and find a new information technology, a web-based instructional technology that it could use that's being used somewhere else and apply it to existing customers. So that would be moving this way. Everyone get that distinction? All right. So the point here is that not all innovation is created equally. Some innovation is very near-term, low risk, low uncertainty extremely profitable usually, and is where most of the resources should go, that's Horizon 1. Horizon 2 is adjacent in either the solution or in the market, and Horizon 3 is really going out into the unknown on one or both of those dimensions. And clearly, risk is increasing as you go out of those uncertain dimensions. Okay, Horizon 1, Horizon 2. All right. Oops. Okay, let me give you another example to illustrate the innovation tournaments idea. Actually, before I do that, let me just back up one. All right, so innovation is about creating value. It's about putting together a new match between a solution and a need. If we're, if we're concerned about creating value, in general in innovation, we're looking for exceptional opportunities. That is, opportunities that are likely to yield much more than we, uh, than we put into them. And that's really the, the key, one of the key challenges in, in innovation is which opportunities do, work, do we pursue and what are the exceptional opportunities. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you three exceptional opportunities and the processes that were used to identify those exceptional opportunities. And I'm going to start with the toothbrush. All right, I brought one with me. Um, this one is fresh. Actually, I might as well open it. Fresh out of the package, though, so no one will be squeamish if I pass it around. Um, the Oral-B cross-action toothbrush, about 10 years ago, became the best-selling sell, best in dollar volume uh, oral care product in the market. Uh, actually, in the manual uh, oral care category. And it's, it's <coughs> sold by Oral-B, which is currently a brand under Parker & Gamble. And um, it was the first toothbrush to give this ergonomic grip and to provide this uh, soft mix of soft and hard materials. So you get kind of a soft grip and it's ergonomic. That's kind of the big ideas behind the cross-action toothbrush. The annual revenues on that cross-action are in the hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Phenomenally profitable product. So for example, this product um, at the Walgreens is, I think, costs about three or four dollars, and my suspicion is that the manufacturing cost, uh, yeah, I don't know, I'd be surprised if it were 53 cents, right? I mean, it's it's not much. It's got you know three ounces of, of uh, an ounce of polypropylene and uh, some kind of elastomer stuck on it. 48 cents, let's say. So phenomenally profitable product. This is a case where I'm willing to pay between three and four dollars for something that costs Parker and Gamble 40 cents to deliver. Right? That's our definition of value creating. Now, if you look at the Oral-B cross-action, you might say, well, the reason that product was so successful, this exceptional opportunity was so successful, is because there was a brilliant industrial designer back there who created this amazing form. Okay. I was just gonna say, <clears throat> don't you have to do the R&D, the advertising, all of oh, that. an account in the room, or a finance major in the room. Yeah. Entrepreneur. Okay, yeah. A realist. <laughs> I'm actually an optimist, but I... Uh, <laughs> you know. All right, so let's do the math. Um, 
that, that you absolutely do, right? So, so if you really want to talk about value creation, uh, I'm glossing over all the accounting that says worth more to you than it costs me to deliver. I gave you the unit variable cost logic, right? I give you the gross margin uh, on this product. Um, and, but let me just start, as an entrepreneur, let me give you the, 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 the heuristic, the very first cut analysis you do, which is, is there gross margin and are there, are there a lot of people who will buy it? And if the answer to those two questions is yes, you probably will be able to cover the investment. I think a quick calculation would reveal that they they cover a lot of investment. With so uh, let's just do the math though. So if they're doing let's say 400 million a year in revenue, uh, that's in retail. So Walgreens probably gets about 40 percent of that. So they get uh, 240 million to um, Procter and Gamble. We've worked out let's just say the the, the profit contribution. Um, I already did 40 percent. Somebody can do this uh, in their head. Let's, let's just call it uh, 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 two bucks. Uh, so they're they're doing. It's always a great risk doing arithmetic in front of a group of 100. Let's just say <laughs> let's just say the gross profit contribution is probably in the order of 100 million dollars a year. All right, and I can tell you the development expense was not 100 million. I, I think the development expense was probably in the tens of millions. So this is a wildly profitable thing. Okay. Good question. Okay. So um, back to where this came from. Wildly profitable. We'd love to have more like this. Um, the you might conjecture that that this was an act of serendipity that resulted from a brilliant creative act by an industrial designer. He came up with this idea, and uh, and then it, it made it into the marketplace. And there were brilliant industrial designers involved, but I actually I was I, I do quite a lot of work with the industrial design firm that, that created the handle for this product. And let me just show you uh, the way they did that. Uh, the actual process was one in which the designers created several hundred pencil sketches of different toothbrush concepts. Several hundred. All right. They took the best two or three dozen of those. And they made uh, balsa foam models. Balsa foam is just a plastic version of what you might think of as balsa. Balsa wood. It's a little easier to work with. And those are shown there on the perimeter of this of this photo. The, the design team themselves internally then just kind of felt them, passed them around, and said, "Which of these feel the best?" They took the best five shapes, and um, they made them in the engineering materials, and they tested them with consumers. Um, uh, just a couple of asides that you might find interesting about the oral care business. One is that there are five distinct grips that people use in brushing their teeth. And they even have, Procter & Gamble, Oral-B even has a thing called the Gripinator, which articulates what the five grips are. And I don't remember all five, but one of them is, you know, the pencil grip. One of them is the screwdriver grip. And you probably, intuitively, you know which one you are. But there are actually five distinct grips. And one of the real challenges is getting to work with all five grips in the Gripinator. Right. So the other thing you might find interesting is that, um, or it might dissuade you from a career in oral care, is, is uh, they have toothbrush labs uh, with, with uh, two-way mirrors where they actually, actually P&G has employees uh, that, and for example, their Gillette division, they're told not to shave till they get there in the morning. They go into the labs, they shave in the, in the labs, they have two-way mirrors in the showers, by the way. They just they, they do observational studies on pretty much everything, and um, and that's how they figure out that's how they figure out what works and, and what and what doesn't. All right, and um, and the, the this is the one, by the way, that, that emerges the winner. So what looks like the serendipitous act was actually the result of really a Darwinian struggle for uh, supremacy on the part of the, uh, the uh, <laughs> and, um, and this is what emerged, you're over Okay, the, the second example I want to give you is from a very different world, which is animated motion pictures. All of you have seen the movie made by Pixar. Um, the one most recently winning Academy Awards was Up, but this is an example from the movie Cars. Cars, the way Pixar works is Pixar produces one new feature film each year. What you probably didn't know was that for every 
feature film they produce, they consider 500 opportunities. Now, an opportunity for Pixar is what they call a pitch. And it's a one-sentence description of the feature film. The, the, the pitch for, for Cars was a hotshot race car named Lightning McQueen gets waylaid in Radiator Springs where he finds the meaning of friendship and family. That was it. That was the sentence. And that sentence competed with 499 other sentences to become the movie that they eventually made, that they eventually put 50 to $100 million in uh, to develop into the actual uh, feature film. Um, now, if you, if you think a little bit carefully about that, they don't, they don't do this entire process in a year. It takes three to five years to get from pitches to movies, but the pipeline is set up such that they are on average considering three to five or 500 pitches for every one that comes out at the end. And so those of you who are operations management managers will realize that they'll have several hundred more in the pipeline uh, over, over time. Okay, the third example is from the pharmaceutical industry. This is for the pharmaceutical product Zocor, which is a statin drug. It goes by the generic name Simvastatin, and it has that molecular structure. And the, the pharmaceutical industry is really fascinating. Those of you who haven't been exposed to it, let me just give a little background. The so-called uh, small molecule pharma business, which is most of what you think of as pharmaceuticals, is a process in which the company screens 10,000 newly discovered chemical compounds in the hopes of identifying a drug that is, that is uh, safe and clinically effective. And in fact, they go through a series of screens. Actually, let me start with where the compounds come from. This is fascinating. Um, the pharmaceutical company Merck that makes SOCOR uh, instructs its employees when they go on vacation to take a, a jar with them and to scoop up dirt. So if you go on vacation to, I don't know, Yellowstone National Park, scoop up dirt from Yellowstone, Costa Rica, you scoop up, scoop up dirt from Yellowstone, you bring it back, you drop it off, and they look in the dirt, and in virtually every handful of dirt from anywhere on the planet, there's a new compound, a compound that has heretofore been uncategorized. Uh, they put those compounds in libraries, of which they have tens of thousands, and they screen them. Uh, now, the screening process is also really interesting. The first screen is, does this compound have any biological activity? Is it biologically active? That is, does it bind to a protein, basically? Second screen is, does it bind to something we care about? And there are about, there's several hundred known biological targets that are known to be mechanisms in disease, and does it bind to any of those? And then the third screen is, does it kill the bunnies? But they basically test for toxicity. Is this thing toxic or not? Um, uh, then they go to um, uh, a, let me think how this works. Is it, is it safe in a sample of healthy volunteers? And that's usually employees of the pharma company. So cross off oral care, cross off pharma. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, is it safe in a sample of healthy volunteers? Then it goes to uh, efficacy. Is it effective in treating the disease relative to a placebo? Uh, and those are the so-called FDA, phase one, phase two, phase three, so forth. Um, and what those companies have to do is they have to look at 10,000 compounds for every one that comes out the end. It becomes safe and effective uh, and can be uh, used as a drug. Yeah. Is this an example <coughs> of like the, the second level of your innovation here? Yeah, good question. So um, this would be an example um, of, I would argue, yeah, I'm not going to go back to that six slides, but I would argue it's an existing customer that you're already serving for heart disease, and it's a new to the world solution. So it would be Horizon 3, uh, but on that horizontal over here. Existing customers, existing needs, but with a new to the world solution. Good question. OK, so that's pharma. Uh, all right, so those are three very different industries, oral care, movies, and pharma, that seem like they're completely different in terms of the way they do innovation. But I would argue that all of these processes for identifying exceptional opportunities exhibit a very similar structure. 
and the structure is what I call an innovation tournament. Now, an innovation tournament has just a couple of distinguishing features. The first distinguishing feature is it considers a large number of raw opportunities, and then it has one or more development and filtering steps that result in the identification of only an exceptional few. Every one of those processes can be thought of in just those terms. Large number of movie concepts, large number of handle concepts, a large number of uh, newly discovered chemical compounds uh, going on the left, and only the, the exceptional emerge on the right. Okay. So that's what I call an innovation tournament. So I certainly didn't invent that idea. That you know is just what's in use. What, what I think I've done, or the, the little bit of contribution I think I've made here, is to bring to bear some scientific thinking about how you manage these tournaments. So um, I'm going to give you a few more examples of tournaments, and then I want to turn to the question of, of how we manage them. This is an example from one of the uh, service businesses that I'm a co-founder of, a company called TerraPass. TerraPass would be a whole other talk. But TerraPass um, is currently the leading retailer of carbon dioxide offsets, uh, so consumer offsets. The basic idea is uh, the, the flagship product is, is a product for, um, the, biggest, the biggest seller for TerraPass is a product that is sold through Expedia. You buy an airline ticket on Expedia, and then in the checkout sequence, you're offered the option to offset the carbon dioxide emissions from that jet travel. Uh, that product is sold is sold by Terrapass, basically. That's what this business did. We were the first company to offer those products in two, back in 2004. We're now the leading uh, retailer in that business. Interestingly, just by way of aside, that was a class I started with 41 of my MBA students. Um, I'll give you even one more aside, which will elicit gasps at that, which is uh, we started that business, and, um, uh, and I made everyone a shareholder in that business. And it was just kind of an idea I had. I didn't really bet the idea all that well. And we said, all right, in this course, we're going to start this business. And by the end of the semester, we actually had customers. So it was kind of going fairly well. And, and, and two, of the, uh, two of the students, two of the MBA students, became the management team. One of them became the CEO. One became the vice president of marketing. And um, uh, about four years later, we were in the middle of Al Gore, Inconvenient Truth, all this you know, attention around climate change and global warming, and, um, and we were acquiring. Um, and I got, had the pleasure of writing an email to the 41 students in the class, in which I said, um, uh, if you will send me your stock certificates, I'll send you money. And, uh, and the average student in the class got $65,000. I knew that would get cast. Uh, including, there's one just kind of funny aside about that. But the lawyers are going through all the, the paperwork, and um, and they said, you said there were 41 students in the class, but I got 42 on this list. I said, no, I swear, there were 41 in the class. I said, no, here she is. This woman right here is the 42nd. She's not on any other list, but she's here in the original paperwork. So I go back, look at my computer, try to figure out what happened. And it was a student who showed up the first week and then dropped the class. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, look, just pay her. You know, it's not worth it. Just basically don't mess around. Just, just pay her. So she was, the, she's the real one. <laughs> 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 All right, that's all about way inside. Uh, now, the, uh, by the way, I haven't quite been able to read that success. Uh, the, the enrollments were quite high the next two years. Uh, the lines back down to normal again. But, uh, the, um, uh, but anyway, the, the point I want to show you here is when we developed the graphic identity for Terra, which is a retail brand, it's pretty important to get that right. We actually used tournaments both for the name for TerraPass. We identified 3,000 3, names. All right, and we put them through multi, multiple rounds of screening until we eventually came up with, with Terrapass, which has worked really well, by the way. Um, we also did a very similar thing with the graphic identity. Now, in fairness, those of you will probably recognize these are not, this is not the work of business students. We hired a graphic design firm. Actually, the same firm that did the Oral-B, uh, the same design firm, Lunar Design, did the graphic identity for Terrapass. Same process. We identified 
Uh, about 100, I think I show 30 or so identity concepts here. We took the best six or seven here. Uh, actually, that's with some, some refinement, and then we did some testing and eventually picked that. That's currently, you go to the TRFS website, that's the identity, identity you'll see. So you see tournament structures not just in a big scale innovation, but also at the micro level, uh, problem solving with, within an innovation context. Probably the best known innovation tournament, um, certainly among this segment. And so, um, although you were in elementary school when this one happened, um, this is the first season, I think, when Kelly Clarkson emerged as, as, as the winner. What's striking about American Idol is the filter ratios in American Idol are even more aggressive than in pharmaceuticals. In, um, in American Idol this year, I think the numbers were between 200 and 300,000 contestants for one eventual win. I mean, just really striking in terms of how aggressive the, the filter ratios are in the American Idol tournament. Another fun example is the X Prize. The X Prize is an example of a public open tournament. The X Prize is a nonprofit foundation that poses challenges of uh, social value. Their first one was for commercial space travel, and the current uh, X Prize is for fuel efficient vehicle design. And so the automotive, the X Prize Foundation has offered a I think it's a twenty million dollar prize to the team that can create a vehicle that gets the equivalent of about 100 miles per gallon, um, and they can produce an economic. They also have to produce a business plan that shows that it can be made, I think, for about $20,000 in volume. Uh, what's interesting about the XPRIZE is it attracts uh, contestants from all over, including you know, large automotive companies like Daimler, but also venture-backed startups like Tesla Motors and Aptera, shown there, but, but also, interestingly, you know, Tom, who's made this out of bicycle parts in its barn in Maine. You know, he's free to, to, to participate. So that's an example of an open tournament, one that's not open to the, to the public. And, and just for full disclosure, most tournaments are not strictly pure cascades from left to right. Uh, most tournaments allow uh, some rework, that is, they allow an opportunity to flow back, they allow opportunities to split, into multiple uh, offspring, and they allow opportunities to pop up in, in the middle of the process. Uh, the extreme case is, is like American Idol. American Idol is pretty much a pure cascade from left to right. You're not allowed, you know, in, in, week, in week two, they don't say, oh, go back and, and do Hollywood again. Uh, sometimes you'll see a contestant show up the next year, but pretty much it's a pure cascade uh, from, from left to right. Okay, let me... Um, <coughs> So, so that's the that's the framework in terms of uh, uh, the way that most organizations in most parts of the world, I, this mechanism that most organizations use to identify exceptional opportunities for innovation. All right, now the question is, how do you operate these with higher performance? How do you get tournaments to, to work for you more effectively? Uh, to illustrate this idea, I want to. I uh, give you a little framework for thinking about what a tournament does fundamentally. And I mean, you need to beg your indulgence for just a little bit of kind of statistics thinking. This will not be, you've all had statistics probably, most of you in the, in the room anyway. So uh, uh, I want you to feel that investment was well worth it. And so we'll use a little bit in thinking about what a tournament does. Fundamentally what a tournament does is it has to do two things. It has to generate a set of candidates. And then it has to discriminate between the good ones and the not so good ones. That's fundamentally what a tournament has to do. And so you can think about it, I like to think about with this diagram here, and we'll think about this thing in blue as the generating process. This is a process that in most organizations will have a flow of ideas coming in from the outside and a flow that are generated internally. And you can think about this process as having some statistical properties to it. So imagine that this is the distribution over quality of the ideas that are generated by the process. Right? Most of the ideas that are generated by the process are average quality, and by definition, the stuff in the middle. And they're relatively few that are exceptionally good. That thin little tail that goes up to the top, and probably 
hopefully, you know, rob a few that are that are really bad to go down like this. So you can think about it this way. And then what the tournament does is it takes those and it puts them over a hurdle so that only the very best clear the hurdle. That's what tournaments do. Now, uh, I wanted to show you some data that we gathered to test the idea of whether this is actually a good way to think about that generating process. And to generate this data, we use a software tool called the Darwinator. And you're free to use it, by the way. It's at darwinators.com if you want to run full tournaments yourself. The way the Darwinator works is, in a, in a submission phase, a group of innovators will submit ideas. Uh, usually, we give them a target. So if I'm working with a class of students, I'll give each student the target of generating five ideas. They submit them to, to the Darwinator. And then in the evaluation phase, uh, the same group of, of students, or it could be a different, but usually the same group of students will go back and they will evaluate, usually on a one to 10 scale, the quality of the ideas um, uh, uh, selected randomly from the pool of ideas that were, that were submitted and excluding their own ideas. And so using that tool, we can get a peer evaluation of between 10 and 20 independent judgments of the quality of an idea. And we can use that tool then um, to, to really narrow in on which of the ideas that, at least in, the ter in terms of the peer evaluation, are of the highest quality. If you do that, I'm, this is real data from a class, one of my classes, that had 47 students in it. We assigned each student to generate five. And let's see, if you do the math, you can see that one student must have not quite finished their homework. Uh, I got 234. Um, and so those, those um, yeah, that's right, just one student didn't do all five. OK, um, 234 opportunities generated by, by 47 individuals. And then the peer evaluations from the Darwinier shake out like this. All right, so on a 1 to 10 scale, it looks kind of like what we would expect it to look like. There are a relatively large number of ideas in the middle there, and there are these two tails. The worst idea in the class, these were for new business ideas, the worst idea was called revenge social networking. <laughs> and the idea was, okay, I have a revenge act, I need to act it out, you have one, you need to act it out, I'll do yours and you'll do mine. <laughs> <laughs> you key her car, if, you know, whatever. Okay, so that's the, that's the, uh, uh, that was that idea. Not that bad, really. But, uh, <laughs> but it was the worst idea there. Uh, the best idea there was uh, two guys from India who said, man, we don't get this US healthcare stuff. Let me get this straight. If you, have, if you need bypass surgery and you're uninsured in the US, your choices are find $150,000 somewhere. That's choice A. Choice two is wait till you have a heart attack and hope you get to the emergency room. And then they have to give it to you. And, and choice number three is find $8,000 and get it done in India. Hmm. That, that would be pretty attractive. So they worked up a business that answers the question that all of us would have when faced with that choice, which is exactly which hospital in India has the best surgeons, the best outcomes, <laughs> uh, right? And we want to know that before we just get on the plane. And so that's what those guys did. Yeah. A very interesting uh, concept. Yeah. So you're saying in general, like in any category, you have like tons of ideas and it generally showed up that there was one or you know, top percent or just a little bit of really good ideas and in the middle there were a whole bunch. Good question. So the first thing to say is in, in almost any tournament, there will be a definition of scope, right? Of the charge, the innovation charge that you're faced with. In some organizations, that will be very, very broad. So it might be, for example, in Procter Gamble, they routinely run tournaments that have the flavor, or I'll give you a better example, Staples ran a, ran a tournament, a public tournament, for a, a, a good idea in office products. That was it, right? Very open-ended, right? In other cases, you'll get very focused charges, like we need a brake handle for a toothbrush. Those are very different charges. Now, it isn't really fair to mix the toothbrushes in the office products. But if you look at just the toothbrushes or just the office products, they're going to look like this. And we've, we've looked at this for 30 or 40 different domains. They all look like this. They, they, and by, by this, I mean 
they all have, uh, in statistical terms, what you would call a unimodal distribution. Right? There's a big hump in the middle. And more significantly, and really all that matters here, is they all have a, um, are we at our 220? Yeah. Yeah. We are? OK. Pause. If you're bored or have class uh, and you need to leave, uh, you can do it now. I think it would be strange right, if you were to look at this data and most of the ideas were at the top. Right? That would be a kind of a strange distribution. So I don't think this is entirely surprising. But this is what they all look like. Yeah. So when is social networking in this world, how do they end up in the same number? Ah, good question. What was the charge for this tournament is the basic question. The charge for this tournament was uh, new ventures serving, this was an executive MBA class, so it was new ventures serving early <coughs> professionals 25 to 45. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think we had some additional criteria that could be projected in less than six weeks. That was the, the course set. Yeah? Did any of these actually come to the end of it? Um, yes, yeah, so although not that top one. So the, the, the one that came to fruition in this year um, is a business called Office Drop, which is basically, it's kind of evolved over the years, but and it's been three or four years since this, this class, but they do, um, uh, it's kind of a Netflix for, for, your, for scanning your documents. It's kind of a weird thing, but you, any paper, they take your paper documents and they create indexable PDF files of them, and they give you a reasonable envelope. So you send an envelope in, they send you a new envelope, you send more documents, and, uh, and that's the point you want. But they were, I think, about the number three or four <coughs> here. They're still operating. I don't know that they're going to be successful, but that, that was the one that came out. Um, by the way, my philosophy in teaching this class, just as, as an aside, when you're taking an entrepreneurship class, uh, I, you could take this uh, to whether or not the instructor does, which is, you know, don't treat it as make work, right? Don't treat it as homework. Treat it as, hey, I'm, I'm really interested in this. I think it's something I might want to do. And so I tell them in a class that there will be no make work in the class. Nothing we do in that class is just for the sake of learning. Not that that's a bad thing, but nothing's an exercise. Everything we do in that class is for real, some of which isn't going to be pursued, but it's all taken, I think, pretty seriously, which is why I believe this is pretty good data, because I think it's... Um, uh, I think it's pretty indicative of what we see in industrial practice. Um, okay, so that's where was it going? Okay, so so you know this is one set of data. I've I've done this for thirty or forty different domains. You get very similar kinds of of, of, of of data. So the question then is, given a statistical distribution like this, how would you maximize the performance of a tournament that relies on gathering and filtering this information? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you four ways to do that, and I'm going to give you some examples uh, behind each of those four ways. So let me let me first just give you the four ways, and then let me illustrate each of those. So the first idea, and probably the one big idea that you should take away from here is, if you do nothing else, generate more ideas. All right, and I'll show you why that matters here in a minute. But that's lever number one. The second thing is, if you can find a way to do it, find a way to shift the average here, shift the average quality of the ideas here. And I'll say in a minute how you can do that. Uh, the third thing, which you won't find intuitive, but when I explain it, it'll make sense to you, is to increase the variance in, that, in the quality of the ideas in, in this process. And the fourth thing is to increase the accuracy of evaluating the opportunities. And I'll just say a little more about that. OK, so for, first, increasing the number. Um, let me, let me actually go back to this. So, so the logic for increasing the number is basically assume that the base case is one in which there is. So you have a filter ratio of 11 to 1. The logic of considering more is to simply consider more opportunities for every one that you pursue. Now, theoretically, what has to be going on for that to make sense is that there has to be a decent chance that in those extra four ideas that you consider, there's at least one that's better than would have been in this set, right? And that's got to be the logic of increasing the number of raw opportunities. And we can actually show mathematically that that's the case. And I'm going to, if you'll bear my indulgence, I'm going to walk you through that math a little bit because I think it's, it's pretty interesting. 
it's a nice illustration of uh, use of statistics here. But um, let's imagine that you're generating ideas for new ventures. And let's just for the sake of argument say you believe that the world of opportunities follows this kind of distribution. If you want to generate just one idea, right? The first idea you generated. On average, how good would you expect it to be? In the middle, right? It could be a five and a half. Right? So if we generate just one, on average it's going to be a five and a half. Right? Remember by that? Okay. Now the power of generating, the power of a tournament is, now imagine you generate two ideas. Now what a tournament does, it doesn't take the average of those two. It takes the best of those two. Right, so now if I generate a second idea, and I want to know on average how good is the best of those two ideas. Is the best of those two ideas higher or lower than five and a half? It better be higher, right, because that second idea has at least a coin chop, coin toss chance of being better than five and a half. And now I'm gonna take the best of those two, right? And so I can always throw away the, the worst of the two, I keep the best. Okay, generate a third. Does the average of the third, does the best of the, of the three better or worse than the best of two? Better than better, right? And so in fact, we can construct a curve, and this is, this is actually doing the math for that distribution. The curve shows, on the vertical axis, the quality of the best of the opportunities you generated as a function of the number of ideas you generated. All right, now the curve looks just the way you would expect it to, right? Which is, if you generate just one idea, you get a five and a half. The second idea gets a little bit better. The third idea gets, the best of those three gets a little bit better. And, you know, by the time you're, you've generated 30 ideas, you're up to a seven. The best of your ideas is the seven. And then, as you would expect, that curve flattens out. Because by the time you get to 300, what is the chance that the 301st idea will be better than all of the previous 300? Very small, right? So that's why that thing gets flat. Now, the, the question you should ask yourself is the last time you generated ideas, how many did you generate? Four? Right? You know, 12? Do you really think we're cranky when we get to 20 or 30? I mean, I think most of us operate down here. And the message here is that it just keeps getting better. I mean, you just keep getting the best of your ideas just keeps getting better for a long, long time, out into the hundreds of opportunities. Uh, in fact, let me just pause for a minute and tell you where the idea from the scooter company came from. We, um, actually the guys who did the toothbrush, Lunar Design, I've done a lot of work with them over the years. Uh, my brother is a PhD engineer who's a real engineer. He's not somebody who then went into business or business school. He he's like really does engineering. And, and he, has, he had all these uh, uh, cool tools, computer control, machine tools and stuff. Um, and, and then we had a fourth partner that was a market research and branding firm. And, and we said, look, you know, Carl has this sabbatical coming up and wants to start a business. The four of us got together and we said, all we know is that it's gonna be us doing this business. Uh, we, we just have to figure out what it's gonna be. And so we set out a list of criteria. The criteria were that we could do it with our resources, that we could do it within about a year, that we could do it with our own money, which, you know, we were all, we all have jobs, so we could, I think we, we figured we could come up with about $100,000 among the four of us. Um, we wanted to sell something over the web, because this was in 1999, the web was just getting going. We wanted to do something that had a live design content, because we had this industrial design partner. We wanted something that could be patented, and we wanted something that was fun. Those were our criteria. And, um, and so we identified over 200 raw opportunities at that level. Mostly, with, it was long before I did this research, long before I wrote this book, but basically the same process. We, we each generated, you know, there were maybe eight or ten individuals, we each generated 15 or so, 15 or 20 opportunities. We put them all on a spreadsheet, we made sense of them, we sorted them, and we, we, we strangely uh, ended up picking a scooter. Uh, which actually served us pretty well, but it was the best of, of those opportunities. The ideas are 
very diverse and they were on. You know, back to this point that was made earlier, they were all over the map. They, they were all physical goods because they this was a design firm and that's kind of the way we're applying. But I'll give you a sense that the second best idea, I still have the spreadsheet, the second best idea was for a uh, digital picture frame, which in 1999 was, you know, totally crazy idea. I mean, digital photography was just happening. And we thought, wouldn't it be cool if you could make a, make a, a picture frame that would display it? That was the second best idea. One of the other ideas we had, I'm just remembering some of them, was uh, centerpieces for your table that would do interesting things dynamically. You know, like you could imagine having something at dinner that would, I don't know, you know move or something. Uh, that's as far as that idea got. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we, I mean, you know, they were all over the map, uh, just wacky stuff like that. But you know, the, the point is, it, you know, you really, my my belief is, you really have to look at a couple hundred, or you benefit from looking at a couple hundred before you pick them. You can put a lot of resources into creating a new venture. It doesn't make sense to do that around an idea that isn't. You know, you'd much rather have a seven point six. Than a, than a than a six point six if you're gonna if you're gonna invest the time in. so that's the logic there the, 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 you know if you take one thing away the way you improve the performance the way you improve the prospects for innovation is have a better opportunity the single best thing you can do to get a better opportunity is to just generate more ideas and it keeps getting better for hundreds of ideas yeah what was it about the scooter and bike company that stood out to you? Well, the bike came much later. So the, sco the scooter at the time, now you have to put yourself back at the time in 1999, there was no Razor scooter. And what's, you know, I should have my scooter talk because I can show you some cool stuff in that. But I'll tell you a funny uh, story about the scooter. The idea itself, we articulated with the PowerPoint slide. We put together a bunch of PowerPoint slides on the top 100 or so of the ideas. The idea we articulated with the magazine clipping from um, uh, Pixar. It was a magazine company from Fortune magazine that had a photo of Ralph Guggenheim, who was an executive at Pixar, riding a kid's scooter in the halls of Pixar. You can see the storyboards for Buzz Lightyear in the background and everything. And, and I remember thinking, actually it was an idea I suggested I contributed, I remember thinking it's, it's pretty interesting that these hipsters at Pixar are really into scooters, and yet they're riding this thing wasn't really designed for a hipster, it's, it's a kid's scooter. Uh, wouldn't it be cool if we created a scooter that was really for them? That was the idea. And um, what's funny about that is the scooter did really well on all those criteria. We, we knew it was easy to do, it had design content, we could get a patent, we could sell it direct, it was fun. It, it satisfied all our, our requirements. What we didn't know is whether anyone would buy it. Um, and this was before Razor. We introduced actually the same month that Razor did. So August of 99, we introduced and Razor introduced Believe me, they sold a lot more than we did. Um, but we're still selling them. Uh, and they're not selling, well, they're still selling a few, but we're probably selling more now than they are, because we built something that was really for, uh, okay, so why is that, why did I tell the Pixar story? Because our single biggest customer now is Pixar employees. It's the most bizarre thing. Um, <laughs> Steve Jobs, who's uh, chairman of Pixar, has, um, has, has three objects in his Spark Clean office. A Noguchi coffee table, which is uh, an Ames plow chair, two kind of icons of, of uh, furniture design, and a Zooter scooter, which is so cool, right? That's the way Steve Jobs gets around on our scooter. And um, uh, but that's where what's so funny about that is that's where the original idea came from, was from Pixar, and then they just found us uh, somehow. So yeah, you know, that solution was out there, that need was out there. We we, we put them together. But um, and the next product is called an i scooter. Yes. You know, what's, I'll tell you a funny story about that. We, we tried to get a little, Apple does pretty well with our scooter too, but we tried to get a little bit of brand value with the Pixar thing. So we, we put some blurb on our website about the most popular scooter at Pixar, uh, something like that. And we got a very polite letter from their lawyers. It was very polite. It was an email. And he said, guys, look, I got one of your scooters. I know we all ride your scooters. You just can't do it. You know, we're just really picky about the brand. You just can't. It's like, all right, all right. Um, uh, all right, so single biggest lever, generate more ideas. And that, you know, you, you, 
it, it's, it's right mathematically, it's right in practice, it just makes total sense. And the, the objection that people have to not generating is, oh, I don't have any more, it costs too much, it takes too long. Um, you know, just get more people, get more people involved. It is, in, in all of my efforts, it's, it's just not been hard to get this up into the hundreds. And, uh, uh, and, and the other really striking thing is, in terms of, in terms of the statistics of it, the ideas you generate, the, the 203rd idea, is no worse on average than the first thing. That is, the, this process keeps generating ideas from that same distribution way into the process, hundreds into the, into the process. Yeah? Um, the criteria that you set for the original company, is that, um, is that considered a first filter? Or is that criteria to basically uh, filter out um, so that you have quality generated ideas? Good question. Yeah, so, so it's a great question, and it relates to the second, um, the second level, which is shifting the mean of the distribution. And I'll say why it's related here in a minute. You know, you have to have some kind of charge for what the innovation charter is. I mean, otherwise you're just wandering aimlessly. Um, it's always a it's always a, 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 a dilemma or a decision you have to make as to how much of the criteria you put into that charge versus how to what extent you apply those criteria as a filter. In other words, do you pull the opportunity generation process with your decision criteria, or do you just apply it as a filter later? And, um, and that's a tension. I'll tell you why it's a tension. It's because, in general, you're going to get better ideas if you apply the, if you pull with the criteria. If you say, look, we're looking for physical goods, we're looking for things that can be patented, we're looking for things we can sell to college students, we're, you know, that, you're going to get better, you're going to get ideas that you like better if you do that. Um, on the other hand, you're going to really limit the space of possibilities, and you're going to constrain the idea generation process. That's why I say it's a, it, it's a trade-off. We did establish the criteria in advance, and we used it to pull the process. Um, I would probably today, I would advocate a little more general charge, a little more open-minded charge, and then a separate identification of criteria that we used to filter. Yeah. Over there, there's been a question. Yeah, you know, I, for 20 years, I've been totally blind to my thoughts. So, okay. Okay. That's fine. I was just wondering if, in the idea generation, if you get too married to an idea early on, how do you get past that? It seems like there's a lot of times where you get going, you get a few good ideas, and you have a one well, that could potentially be great, but you attach yourself too early before you keep going off. How do you take care of that? Yeah, good question. Um, so I think I think this is the real distinction. If I were to point to one distinction between amateur and professional entrepreneurs, it's it's that, which is. The, the, the sure sign of a rank amateur is you had an idea and you're stuck with it. You're like, you know, this is my idea, I'm going to pursue this thing. And you, we kind of have a mythology about that. You, you stick tenaciously to this idea. But I think the, the best entrepreneurs and innovators within a, you know, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship are ones who are somewhat agnostic about which idea they're going to pursue, who can be detached from it and who can say, what I have here, the critical resource here is my time and my effort and my passion. I want to make sure I jump on the right thing here. So I'm going to carry forward several alternatives, keep my strategic options flexible until I know enough to, to bet on the right, on the right uh, horse here. Um, okay, so that's, that's kind of my main answer to that point. Having said that, um, I have been guilty uh, more than once of, of starting a business, I actually started more than three. There are three that I might take credit for, but started more than three. Um, I'll actually tell you, I'll tell you a story of one of them. So I have a little business, um, well, so I think I do the backstory. So, so I, I, in, in my product development course, I teach a little module on ex design experiments, some statistics stuff. And somebody at the University of Virginia, an engineering professor at the University of Virginia, makes a thing called the statifold, which is a catapult for launch, that launches ping pong balls that lets you adjust variables and measure the distance the ball goes. So I bought one to, to use in class. It cost $300. It was made with a router, wood, and door hinges and stuff. And you know, you put it in front of the class. 
And as an engineer, I looked at this thing and I said, you know, it's not too nice. And I could do better. And what would be really cool is if I could give one to every student at home to do the exercise and come back to class. So I went home and I designed this little thing that I could give to students to take home. And, and, uh, and, and I made a prototype. I liked it. And then I made 50 so I could try it in class. It went pretty well. And then my colleague said, um, uh, he said, you know, I'd really like to use that in the core course, but we need 300 to do that. Uh, what are we going to do now? So, so I got my brother to make 300 for us. And then we had a colleague um, somewhere else, actually, well, I can't remember which colleague it was, somewhere else who said, oh, I'd like to use that in my core course. Now we're thinking, what do we do now? This is like, you know, we're going to need like 400 of these, 400 more. So I went to one of the scooter suppliers in Taiwan. I said, can you make this silly catapult for us? And, um, and they said, sure. So we ordered 1,000. And um, I don't know, we're up to now like 40,000 of these stinking things. And we have a website. It's called Xpult. You show up by one. Xpult.com. <laughs> and, um, and, and I will sell, you know, my, actually it was my colleague Christian, my father and I, we'll sell 10 of these catapults today on a website. Mostly to middle school uh, science fair, for middle school science fair projects. That was not done by Turner. That was done by, I have an itch, let me scratch it, let's see if anybody else has that itch, okay, and you just kind of get going. That's actually a fairly typical trajectory in innovation. You have a need, you go solve it, and guess what, somebody else uh, has it. So I'm not saying that Turner's is the only way, I'm just saying that uh, it's the most professional way. I could not quit my job and be the catapult uh, magnet of the world. I mean, there's just, you know, that's not a big enough business, but it's still a business. It is a model for how you can, uh, how you can, how you can work. Yeah, what other e-commerce are you involved in? Uh, e-commerce, okay, so um, TerraPass is principally a, a, a dot com. Um, Smatchy is looking dead, so I'm not going to tell you about it. Um, I the office so so I would say that that um, there's one other which is a higher education product called Epodia, which is an aggregator of uh, teaching materials, which is kind of a nonprofit. That and and then and then I'm involved in several strictly as an advisor. Is I was you know possibly. Considered part of the founding team, but I have no manager, so I'm, I'm kind of a peripheral, peripherally involved. I teach a course in uh, design development of web-based products and services. So every year, you know, there's a few that, that, that come out of it in all kinds of all, all kinds of ways. Okay, so um, I talked about. Let me just quickly give you these other levers, and then I want to just open up. Uh, I can give you. I'll just give you one more lever. I actually want to give you both these levers. Okay. Because they're, they're pretty interesting. Okay, so this is a little bit mind warping. This is the variance level. Remember, I said generate more, shift the mean. The idea on shift the mean, there are a couple ideas there, but one of the ideas is one of the ways you can shift the mean upward, shift the mean of that distribution upward, is to pull with your criteria, to pull the opportunity generation with your criteria. Okay, the, um, the third level is to increase the variance in the quality of the ideas. Now, let me be clear about what I'm saying about that. I'm saying you should deliberately generate ideas that vary more widely in quality, better and worse. Just increase the variance. Now, the logic of that is if you have a process that produces an output that has some distribution like that, you can see kind of what the variance would be. The normal logic in business is you want to drive out variance and get it. This, this has the same mean, the lower variance. Right? Remember by that? Same mean, Q, the lower variance. This also has the same mean, but higher variance. This has one really good and a bunch of quite bad, but they average out to Q. In most of business, you strongly prefer this to this. In innovation, you prefer this. If you, to make an analogy, if you had a chain of pizza restaurants, you would prefer, most pizza, you know, most pizza entrepreneurs would prefer a chef who made 100 pizzas of identical quality, even if they weren't the most amazing pizzas, right? 
But you would prefer, in innovation, you prefer a chef who makes 99 inedible pizzas and one amazing pizza. Just one. And the reason for that is, in innovation, you don't have to eat all the pizzas. Right? You can throw away 99 as long as you've identified the one. And so variance is your friend in terms. It is okay to have ideas that are really out there. Because they're easy to throw away. They're easy to not eat. Right? As long as you occasionally get a great one. I'm giving you an example back from the Automotive X Prize. Now, here's a question. You're running the X Prize competition, and let's imagine you were issuing, issuing invitations to teams to submit entries to the Automotive X Prize. Think about what kinds of organizations you would invite. You go to find the electric vehicle manufacturers, you go to the big auto companies, you might go to the venture capitalists, you might go to some of the leading engineering schools around the country and internationally. Right? It's the kind of thing you do. Go to MIT, go to Tesla Motors, go to Daimler. You would probably not go to an automotive technical high school in West Philadelphia. And, uh, and they are considered by many favorites to win the X-Prize. The, the Botech in West Philly, sandwiched between crack houses, and I mean, I'm not kidding you, by the way. I mean, this is about the roughest neighborhood in the country. There's a little Botech there. They teach automotive you know, technician, teach field the auto mechanics. They are, likely, they, they are currently in the top 40 out of several hundred. Uh, entrance, and they're favored by Wired and Popular Science to be in the top ten. Anyway. You know, that's the most bizarre thing. There's a whole interesting story about this team. It's a fascinating story. But uh, you wouldn't invite them, and normally. And, and this is an example of how broadening the, the scope of your of the opportunities that you consider in innovation, most of the time, most of the time, the Botech at the local high school is going to have a terrible entry. But occasionally, you're going to get this brilliance. And, and it really doesn't cost you much to let everybody audition, basically. And that's the logic. And in your own innovation tournaments, it doesn't really cost you anything to have, to have a bad idea. Right? Write it down. Consider it for a few minutes. No, no, no real cost to that. And occasionally, you're going to have a flash of brilliance along with those bad ideas. And so increasing variance increases the performance of innovation tournaments. Okay. Uh, okay, the last thing I wanna I wanna show you before I finish up at least the formal part is the fourth lever, which is improving your ability to discriminate the good from the bad. And I want to show you some data from one of my classes. This is three phases of an innovation tournament. Uh, Actually, before I show you the data, let me give you, yeah, I'm going to show you the data. Okay, so uh, three phases of innovation tournament. An opportunity pitch in which students gave a 60-second presentation with one PowerPoint slide. You know, medical tourism, right? Just one PowerPoint slide, here's the idea. And what we did is we sticker voted. So everybody got six stickers, we voted <coughs> on the What these circles are, are each of the 50 or so opportunities that were pitched. And their vertical position is the number of stickers they got in votes. From zero, these four opportunities got zero, these five got one, these four got two, and so forth, up to 21. Okay, so one idea got 21 votes. Everyone get what that is? Okay. Then two weeks later, teams of two, we eliminate some teams, teams of two come back, and they articulate a concept which is both a, a definition of the opportunity in terms of the need, but also what the solution concept would look like. They get two minutes, two PowerPoint slides, we vote again. And this is where how the voting shakes out. And the lines here indicate the trajectory of the same opportunity. All right, so you, you can follow a line to see what happened to the voting, to where they fell in the ranking from, our, from the first phase to the second phase. And then the third phase, was four weeks later. This was a business plan presentation. Six slides, six minutes, financial analysis, uh, technical feasibility, market research, development plan, that kind of stuff. Right? And then this was not a sticker book. This was uh, intent to invest in the, in, the, in the venture. But similar 
kind of its quality rank, basically. All right, now some of this looks just like you would expect it to, which is opportunity A started out good, was good in the middle, ended up good. Opportunity E was bad at the beginning, bad at the middle, bad at the end. Why is opportunity there? Because I'm not a tyrant. As a professor, I just say, look, this is the data. If you really want to do it, you can. And that team really wanted to do it. So they, they stuck it out. What's interesting, I just want to describe two opportunities here. One is opportunity B, which um, started out as a recipe database for the web that included video clips of the difficult move in the recipe. And it was kind of an OK idea. It was in the, in the middle. They came back the second week with a modification of the idea. They said, well, we thought about this. We interviewed a bunch of people. And we decided that a better idea would be to come up with a standard data structure for all recipes so that we represent ingredients with variables. And we have real values for their quantities. And then we can do very powerful search. We can do very powerful calorie counts, um, unit changes, uh, serving size adjustments. We can do all that automatically. And if we can own that standard, then that can be a big business. We're going to call this Fidelio. We really, we really thought about it. By the way, the, the, uh, the champion here was, uh, he'd been at Google. He was going back to Google. And everyone's kind of said, and, and that guy can do it, too. Um, so that was opportunity B. And so it went from being kind of you know in the middle to being the top rated idea. Opportunity C was a group of students who were interested in golf, and their idea was a Sharpie marker that had RFID ink in it. And you would write your initials on the ball, and when you lost your ball, you'd have an RF detector that would find the ball. Right? Everybody like that? They came back the second week, and they had a uh, industrial designer's rendering of what the device would look like, what the user interface was, how it would go in your belt. And, um, and then they came back at the business plan and they said, turns out that's not going to work. There's not really enough material in the Sharpie ink to be able to detect it. We talked to some physicists, we went to the engineering school, it's not going to work. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to give you a helmet. <laughs> right? You know, it's kind of goggle, you know, it's kind of, you know, it makes no sense. Okay, now we laugh at this, but this is utterly normal. This is what happens to opportunities. And so the best thing you can do to accurately discern uh, opportunities, or the best opportunities, is to design a series of filters that are quite coarse initially, quite generous typically initially but then at some point become much more aggressive as the amount of estimates, as you have more refined information. Now it's instructive, I think, to look here and say, how deep would we have had to have gone in that initial set of opportunities to reliably have picked opportunity D? Right? To be sure we got the top four, we would have had to carry forward two-thirds of those raw opportunities. Right? And so my you know, to go back to this question, really, of, of, you know, do good entrepreneurs think this way? I really think it makes a lot of sense early in the process to carry forward a dozen or so things that you're interested in. Wait until you have, I mean, this, this step here is very inexpensive. Talk to three or four customers, potential customers, think about how you might address the thing. You maybe come up with a brand, you help visualize what it would be, you articulate it. And, and then you make a, a more aggressive cut before you have to spend real money, right? Before you have to uh, get on an airplane or build a prototype or do something that's going to cost you some money, you, you, then you're more aggressive. But while you're still just noodling on stuff, there's really no reason not to keep a whole portfolio of options alive. And that's going to be your fourth lever because it's going to make sure that you really did get Kelly Clarkson, right? You didn't kill Kelly Clarkson in the first round. Okay. Uh, all right. Should I just declare an end and then fall and then and take, then take take one or two more? Okay, questions. one or two questions, then I'll hang around. <coughs> How does comparison factor into evaluating the quality? So you have an idea that on its own may have been an average idea, but compared to the rest of them, it seems. Exactly yeah. Who's watching American Idol this season? You know, a few of you. All right. Everyone's complaining, right? Just how bad all the singers, how did he get this bad? How is it possible all these singers? 
Yeah, I mean, it, if you happen to show up, you, you know, Kelly Clarkson on one side and, and you know, I mean, you, you know, Daughtry on the other, I mean, it's, it, it, it's tough, right? And so there's no question about it. In fact, there's a whole strategic choice you make in organizations as to whether you do relative or absolute comparisons in, in tournaments. And typically, the short answer to that is um, you, do, you do absolute comparisons for the uh, absolute judgments for the really hot ideas. When a hot idea comes along, you don't compare it to anything else, you just go ahead and, and forward it. When you get to having to allocate scarce resources, you're very careful to do a relative comparison and pick the best few of, of those opportunities. Because unambiguously, I think unquestionably, who, who your company is is going to have a, uh, some bearing on, on how an opportunity is, is valued. No question about it. Yeah. Now, I've, I've heard what product development that you in the past do experimental with pancakes. Is that correct? Is it children that determine exactly what the best recipe looks? <laughs> um, uh, living in my, growing up in my house is, let's just say, a, uh, a difficult uh, process. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny about that? You know what's funny about that? My choice is true. I, I, uh, I've done a lot of process improvement and, and cooking at home. But what's funny about that is my 13-year-old, who is my youngest son, is now just a pancake master. That kid loves pancake pancakes. Was there a question there? Was that no, he said like how many terrible recipes did they have to go through before you found that perfect man? Uh, they don't complain much. They've been good children. <laughs> <laughs>